Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, he drank my water. Um, <laughs> Um, so one thing that um, he did leave out that gives me a little more credibility for this talk is that I was also graduate dean here at NC State and um, also developed interdisciplinary graduate programs at um, Oregon State University. I actually, one of my first tasks as a brand new um, faculty member in a very interdisciplinary type appointment was to help plan a brand new interdisciplinary graduate program. So you can imagine back in the day when I was um, a brand new assistant professor. That was a pretty revolutionary thing to have an interdisciplinary graduate program. So um, I do have quite a bit of experience with that along the way. Oops, we need to get my talk up. Okay. So one of the things I, and you'll hear this throughout, that I realized, um, thank you, today, as I was putting this talk together, and reading a lot of the reports that are out there is how far advanced NC State is in this area. A lot of the things we're doing here are recommendations from other places to do. So that's um, a great thing to be thinking about. So you've heard a lot of these issues throughout the conference, but I just wanted to reiterate a few of them. And one of them is just the rate, the really dramatic rate at which research methodologies and technologies um, the changes in the workforce needs and the availability of work, what kind of jobs people can go into, um, shifts in demographics and expansions in the scope of um, occupations that need graduate level training is really changing. And so that's something that um, we can't just keep doing things the way that we always have. Um, when I was that um, new assistant professor working on this interdisciplinary program and we would try to do innovative things, um, I can't tell you how many times I heard, but that's not the way we did it at Wisconsin when I was a graduate student. You know, just picking out Wisconsin, but you know, it was always somewhere that, well, that's not. And you know, it's sort of like that thing of, you know, that res medical residents have to do these 36 hour shifts because that's what we did when we were residents. Well, I don't want someone who's been on a 36 hour shift working on me. And the biomathematicians can tell you there's another way to do the math that you can cover that many hours without having people having to be on 36 hour shifts. So we need to think about new ways of doing things. And then the one that's really striking is that less than half, less than 40% of the, I wasn't able to get for all PhDs, but for STEM PhDs at least, less than 40% of them actually work in academia when they're done. And less than half of those, so it's something more like 17%, become individual investigators like their mentors. So that's, we're catering to less than fifth, one fifth of the um, students with the programs that we design. So we need to do something different about that. But I do want to say at this point, we also need to think different about how we train those people that are going into academia, that are going to be the individual investigators, because the demands on them are so much different. You heard the provost say yesterday that they've now done 70 hires in these interdisciplinary clusters here. Well, they're not just working as individual investigators. They're working as parts of these clusters and parts of teams. And even people who aren't hired in that way, that's often the way that things work is teamwork these days. So we need to also think about how we train those folks to not just do that isolating kind of PhD that when I was in that position, I was told that Master's is degree is where you learn to do research, and PhD is where you can prove that you can do an independent project all by yourself. <laughs> and that doesn't prepare you for anything, really. And I don't know, the faculty in the room, how many of you felt like you were trained to do more than 10 or 20 percent of your job before you got into your first position? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> so we need to think differently about how we're training. And we've been doing that and making progress, but I think now's a moment to push forward and do that even more. And there's a lot of surveys out there, quite recent ones, that show both the graduates and the employers don't feel like they're prepared for their new jobs. And so what can we do to better prepare them for that? And especially prepared to turn their, as, where's Amanda? 
as RT, I likes to say, turning knowledge into practice. You know, so how to have impact in, out of what your, um, the research is that you're doing. And then I, something that I have found throughout, and, but is especially true today, is graduate students want to be involved in addressing the grand challenges of feeling like their work matters. And so how can you set it up so that they're not just narrowly focused and they may, and you do need to narrowly focus on one thing to get actual experiments done. But how do you put that in the broader context, and how do you make them feel like they're contributing and doing that in a meaningful way? So if you're going to solve those global challenges, it requires a multidisciplinary approach. I think we've established that well here. Oops. This is what happens when I don't have a Mac. Um, and so again, something, so for those of you who don't know, RTI, and Amanda talked about it yesterday, but there's a very large global research institute. It's right here in the triangle. It had its origins here back in 1958. Um, and it was created by um, local businessmen and, and from the universities as a way to keep brain drain from happening to North Carolina. Because at that time, most of the college graduates were leaving and going to other places because there just weren't jobs here. And so it was created to be a research organization here that they could stay in. But it's become about a billion dollar a year research organization, nonprofit, and a very large component of that work is actually in um, gl global development and implementation. And so they do a lot of programs for USAID in health, in education, in governance, um, all around the world implementing programs for them and developing programs. So it's all very research based. And one of the things I really learned being there is if you're going to work on these global challenges, you really need to sort of have a foundation on understanding what the local needs are in the places this is going to be implemented. And you can't take a broad brush approach. You need to understand what the um, global development needs are and then how to actually implement them. Um, and then you need to understand the social and the political and the economic barriers that there are to adoption or what, is, what it's going to take to actually implement something. And then based on that, then you can design the technologies and um, how to transition those into commercialization or whatever kind of implementation is going to be the way to get them out there. And throughout that entire thing um, is you have to manage innovation all up and down that pyramid. So you need to be able to innovate at all those different levels in order to really make a change in something that's a global challenge. And an example that RTI was involved in before I got there was um, the cook stoves. So there's been cook stove challenges around for a while. And if we could just have all villages have clean cook stoves, then we could help with health. We could have people be able to feed themselves easier. They wouldn't have to cut trees down, all these different things about it. And so U.S. engineers, RTI among them, um, came up with whiz-bang cook stoves, really great cook stoves, and then they would get them out to the villages in whatever area, and they wouldn't adopt them. And it might be because the men couldn't fix them, and they rejected anything that they couldn't fix. Or, you know, or this part could never be replaced again. Or people just didn't think it through and think about what the different cultures were that they were trying to put those cook stoves into. So what you need to do all of this successfully is you need to partner. It's, you have really complex multidisciplinary programs where you need to partner with NGOs, you need to partner with governments, you need to partner with industry, and you need to partner, of course, academia being part of it and the research organizations. So you need people who have the skills to be able to work across all of that and those boundaries and find common languages. Um, you need to be able to transition the technologies from lab to commercial scale. And again, that's something NC State does really great. But it's also a challenge all the time to be able to do that. And then, as I said, you need to be able to implement them globally. So I wanted to give you an example of just one of the global challenges. And one of those is the sanitation challenge. Um, any of you who saw Slumdog Millionaire or, or have been to India, um, that's a fancy toilet. Um, 
And there's over two, almost two and a half billion people across the world today who don't have access to Im what we would call improved sanitation, and it may just actually be something like that. It's um, one in 10 people in the world have to, no option but to defecate in the open. And that's something that is challenges that are for gender, especially for women, often it's only safe, well, it's only proper to do it in the dark at night. And so then it's very unsafe. And um, there's just a lot of other challenges that go with this besides the health challenge. So for, and diarrheal diseases that are the results of this unsafe sanitation kill almost a million children a year. So it's a very serious challenge, and it's one that the Gates Foundation um, decided to take on with their Reinvent the Toilet Challenge, and that they've put really serious funding into. And it's a great challenge. So it's to come up with a toilet that will be um, use no external water, no external power, so it's basically off-grid completely, that it um, safely disinfects and um, cleans the sludge, and that it um, costs less than five cents per day per person to use, and will be sustainable, so that it somehow creates a business model where they'll be kept up and um, sustained and things like that. So many um, organizations did that. They gave out 17 grants, I believe, and RTI was one of them. So just to tell you a little about the, bit about the RTI one, um, again, it was a collaboration with um, Duke University, Colorado State, I know NC State is now contributing, um, various NGOs and industry to put something like this together. And um, what the one they came up with you guys are all still at breakfast. I won't go into detail. Um, but what it does is it not only, um, it basically burns the sludge and uses that to create, um, so sort of like, think pellet stove. So think pellet stove. And then the energy you get from burning the pellets, you then use to chemically, electrically clean up the um, liquids and create excess energy. So if you can imagine for say sustainability, then you also can, you can charge your cell phone while you're using the toilet in the village. So, and people won't pay to use the toilet, but they will pay to charge their cell phone. So I, I love this solution. And they're at the point now where they are testing their prototypes. They've been doing it in India for quite a while and now have moved on to South Africa. But the kind of team that was required to do this was they started first with the international development experts and the sociologists and cultural anthropologists and the survey um, researchers who went into the villages to find out what would be acceptable, what would people use. Um, because it's, it, and then that really varies from place to place. So especially in something as personal as this, there's actually restrictions if you're a Muslim versus a Hindu versus a Christian versus um, something else. So you have to think about what's gonna work for all of those different things. And I don't know if you can see in the picture there, but that's women in India going through one of the prototype toilets to tour it and give their opinions for one of the surveys, uh, the focus group to, um, to actually um, say what they think of it. So then you have to have bring in the economists to think about what is gonna make sense economically. And then, you d then they designed to that. So instead of the cook stove type experience, where you get the engineers together and come up with something that really won't be adopted, they did it the other way around. What will be adopted, and then the whole team works together on then what are the requirements that then the engineers can design to and come up with something really cool. So that's the kind of, and that's why Amanda was perfectly prepared to go to RTI, that working with the GES, she'd been working across those kinds of boundaries. And as she said yesterday, that was in the job description, right, is to be able to work across those boundaries. And so RTI has learned from that what kind of teams they need to be able to put together for their PhD researchers. So I, I also, uh, like Laura, I guess, does she leave already? Yeah must have spent the weekend reading this new report that came out on Friday, um, and it was perfectly timed. And one of the things I wanted that I thought was really interesting about the report is it cites 19 other recent reports on um, the future of graduate education. 
So this is being thought about by a lot of people. You're very timely in, in holding this workshop because um, you know, I, I think it's a groundswell, maybe we could say, of different groups working on this, as you'll see. Um, and so I'm not going to repeat everything she did, but she actually talked about the report in the context of NSF and what they're doing. And what I want to talk about is the report in the context of universities and what they're doing, and so what institutions need to do. Um, and Fred, I'll tell you, Fred asked me to be provocative. Um, so just take that as a grain of salt as I'm going through my presentation or a context. And then um, I went and saw RBG on Friday night, so I'm also very, <laughs> you know, inspired to be provocative. <laughs> and so one of the quotes from Alan Leshner, who was the former CEO of um, AAAS, but he also um, ran programs at NIH and NSF and many other things. Um, one of the things he said in one of the, um, interviews around this was, the current system works well for PIs, institutions, and federal agencies that get relatively cheap labor and churn out lots of papers in top journals, but it doesn't work well for students and for many employers. So Alan, tell it like it is. You know, that's um, kind of the way it is. So I thought that was a great context. And as you heard yesterday, what they're really proposing, and what I think is right on, is a student-focused uh, systems approach. And so you need to look at the entire system. You need to put the student first as you look at that system. And then what can you do to do that? And so, um, and, and then a lot of these other chronic problems would go away of inadequate preparation, lack of diversity, and over-specialization if you have that, that focus. So um, the great thing is about it, it is a true roadmap with action steps. So any of you who haven't had a chance to look at it yet, I recommend that you do so. And they have action steps for each stakeholder. So for the federal agencies, for the universities, for the students, for everybody, what people need to be doing. And it also articulates what core competency all graduate students have. They have a separate list for master's students and, and PhD students. But I think what's really relevant to um, the university is, they said, was what they hope is that this stimulates the review and revision of incentive and reward um, policies, teaching and mentoring practices and curricular offerings, um, career exploration mechanisms, um, transparency about trainee outcomes, and diverse, equitable, and inclusive environments. So those are all things that the universities really need to think about and really review what they're doing. And then I just pulled out a couple of things that I thought were especially relevant here. One was, and they actually cited the Council of Graduate Schools on this one, is that PH students have difficulty finding and taking advantage of resources offered by their universities to develop capabilities beyond research and discipline knowledge. Well, Graduate schools, shame on you if you're not making that obvious. So that's a pretty, that's a really low-hanging fruit is to make available to them. But I think the other part in that sentence is um, they have difficulty taking advantage of it. And so I think that's a problem with flexibility of PhD programs and flexibilities of advisors who have that mentality that they need to be in the lab working every day and not working on things that benefit them. And so I think that's some of the things that we need to think about, how to incentivize the faculty to be encouraging their students to go after these things. And I'm not saying many faculty don't, many of them do, but for those who don't feel like they can take advantage of it, why can't they take advantage of it? Think about that and what is it that we need to change to make them feel that way. And then this one's especially important. And um, it's that, so the University of California at San Francisco and the University of um, California at Davis have both had the NIH um, BEST programs, the Broadening Experiences in Science and Technology. And that's um, basically professional training, especially for, for graduate students in the biomedical fields. And um, they report that the students that um, participated in those programs to expand their career development skills and promote career exploration did not increase their median time to degree for 217 programs in, students in that program. 
And so I think that's really, there's a myth out there that if you do any of these other types of development, that it's just going to take longer. And everyone knows PhD degrees take too long in our country. Um, but this, this is trying to break that myth that it's not true. <laughs> I know when I was at Oregon State University, um, we had one of the GK-12 programs that somebody mentioned yesterday from NSF where you um, allowed the students to also experience um, teaching in, in K-12. And, um, but that was, we had ran into so many faculty and program directors and whatever that said, oh no, it's just gonna increase their time to get that kind of experience. But for those who are thinking about that kind of career, it's incredibly important. So this is, that was a great thing. So just a few more things out of the report that I think I picked out as especially important for the universities is institutions should provide opportunities for students to seek and develop multiple separate mentoring and advising relationships, including those that are interdisciplinary and cross-department. So the, again, building on the tradition has been to have all of your, um, your advisory committee members be from your own department and to have them be in your field. Well, what if we had more diverse committees? And what if we had actually folks from industry on those committees if they're interested in going into industry? Or what about having um, the kinds of committees that you've had with GES that have really a broad range of, of types of professors on them? Um, I'm sorry, Laura's gone. Funding criteria from federal programs present unique opportunities to help shape the culture of graduate education. And so I, I'm incredibly grateful, and I know you all are incredibly grateful for the traineeships from NSF and from NIH, but as Laura showed yesterday, that's only 5% of their graduate student support budget. Expand that, but also use the criteria for those other grants, um, just like the broader impact criteria of are you doing the right things to train graduate students on these grants, and what are you going to do to improve that? It'll, I'll come back to it again and again, but you are what you measure. If you want to create change, you need to measure the right things, and the federal agencies, oh, I don't know which is has more weight, the federal agencies or the university with tenure, but those are two things that if you're measuring these kinds of impacts, you'll see a change in the culture and a change in what's going on. And then professional societies and nonprofit organizations should convene and lead discussions with graduate programs, employers, and other stakeholders and disseminate innovative approaches. Um, I think that's powerful to get them all improved. And I'm a plant biologist, and so I'm going to talk next about what I know um, from the plant sciences community. So there's a case where an entire discipline is looking at what do we need to do to change um, the future of graduate education within that discipline. So um, the plant sciences research community in 2013 came out with um, their Unleashing a Decade of Innovation in Plant Science, a vision for 2015 to 2025, which is known as the decadal vision among plant nerds. And so that, of course, was many years of work before that, but they then came out with the decadal vision. And one of the five major goals within that was to reimagine graduate training. And what they um, have focused on is the T-shaped model. So T-training, they call it, which is you need the depth still. And that's what a PhD especially is about, is you need that depth. But you also need the breadth of all of these different kinds of experiences and knowledge and being able to work together with people. And I don't think they take credit for it, but in 2014 is then the following year is when NSF came out with the NRT program and NIH came out with the, the best program. Um, but it's relevant to this because then the plant um, community um, built upon that by applying for and receiving an NSF research coordinating network grant um, that creates the plant science research network. And that's now 14 plant related societies. Um, that um, is, it's led by the American Society of Plant Biologists and by the Boyce Thompson Institute at Cornell. 
but it really represents the whole community. And as part of that, they've created um, what they call a digital ecosystem um, to connect everybody within the plant um, community. But one of their major focus areas is around this topic of graduate training. And so they've since held two workshops in 2016 and 2017 on postgraduate training. And out of those has come, um, one of the things I think is great is they actually spent the second workshop coming up with pilot projects. What things could actually be done? What are the real projects that could be started to achieve the kinds of recommendations they had? But also what came out of it was reinventing postgraduate training in the plant sciences T training defined through modularity, customization, and distributed mentorship. And that's a, um, uh, a report that is being rolled out this summer. It's not actually out or online yet, but they've allowed me to have a copy of it and to actually, you guys are hitting the premier rollout. This is, right? The first time, Natalie, that anybody, so. And then, um, Natalie Hankhouse, who is the executive coordinator of the Plant Sciences Research Network, is with us. She's in the back of the room there today. So I'll let you all question her with more about it. But I wanted to just give you the highlights about their report. And you'll see a lot of things in common with the National Academies report. So they started with a set of core principles. And I think that is, again, this sort of student-focused, student-centered thing. So trainees should be provided guidance and resources to define and pursue their career objectives. Learning should be flexible, adaptable, and distributed. So not always just that narrow path, but the ability to go different directions with it. And, um, and not always all from the same source. Scientific research experiences should be broad and question-driven whether motivated by basic discovery or seeking solutions to societal challenges. Trainees should be skilled in science communication. That's one that's close to my own heart. That's, um, you know, my, it is to be able to, it's not, how does it go? It's not research until you communicate it. It's not results until you communicate it. And so that's something that we should be training all our students in. And then, because, we're actually trained absolutely wrong by our science training to be science communicators. So we'll give you all of the evidence first and then give you our conclusion. Whereas if you want to communicate science, this is my short course in science communication, if you want to communicate science, you need to do it like a news person and you need to give them the headline first to give them the conclusion and then you can back it up with evidence after that. So th there's a lot more to it, but that's, you know, it just shows you we are trained bass backwards. <laughs> um, and then training programs should foster and facilitate the inclusion of individuals with a diverse range of life experiences and should, pr and should prioritize the trainee well-being. Um, so then they came out with specific recommendations. Again, I like reports that have really specific recommendations. So the first of all, increase the number of competitive grants available to trainees. I think you heard very well from the GES program that if you have funding available to the trainees, it allows them to be able to do these kinds of things and break free of a lot of those shackles of, of other kinds of supports. Rethink mentoring to emphasize individualized development. One of the things they recommend is actually having an individual development plan for each graduate student that you work on not only with your mentor but with your other advisors. Um, create a validated system of customizable modula uh, mod modular experiences. Um, establish institutional support for and facilitation of life work transitions because you've got other stuff going on in your life besides graduate school. Um, develop policies to promote individual well-being and provide opportunities and practical training to develop communication skills and foster a research environment that promotes two-way public engagement. So again, Natalie is here and I'm sure she'll be happy to talk with any of you more about um, what they've done and where they're going next. Um, so I wanted to 
not make it sound like we're doing this all wrong. We're doing a lot of things right, and there's great innovations that are going on. Um, so um, it's one of the things we instituted here at NC State, and I know many other universities have it. And then individual departments and programs like GES all have different aspects of professional development. So you heard that earlier quote, we need to make sure graduate students know it's there, and we need to make sure they have access to it. When we started it here at NC State when I was graduate dean, it's just the response was overwhelming of graduate students just wanting communication skills, how to write a professional email, how to do conflict resolution, all those things we weren't trained in before we became um, faculty. Um, graduate certificates. So I call it the gateway drug to graduate school, that you can for 12 units, you don't have to be admitted to a graduate program, but you can take um, um, a, get a graduate certificate in a specific topic. Um, one of the ones that's incredibly popular here at NC State is the one in geographic information systems because you can add GIS onto your sociology work, you can add it onto art programs, you can add it onto a lot of different science things, the kind of biomath projects we were just talking about using GIS to interact with them. But it's also something that people that are already out in the workforce can manage is doing those 12 credits and coming up with a real certification. So if we want people to have these more diverse um, experiences, they need to get credit for it. So this is a way to give that kind of credit for doing uh, a deep dive into an area, but not too deep of a dive. Um, graduate minors. So that's what you have now for GES, right? And so it's another way without going through a whole new graduate program um, to it, allow people to have that kind of certification and that kind of experience to have that minor. Um, interdisciplinary centers, institutes, and cluster hires. So that's something that um, all of those bring folks together because you have to, I think what you've heard yesterday in spades, is you have to have people working together in common places and doing common things, having common colloquia and projects hopefully to be able to train folks in interdisciplinarity and to be able to address those um, grand challenges. And so again, we're seeing that more and more and, and need a lot of it. And then another thing is putting the prospective employers for that other four-fifths of the kinds of jobs on your department advisory boards or your program advisory boards or getting that input from the external community about what kind of um, folks they're looking for, what kind of training they want. Use that to design your programs and, um, and then also have them be mentors for the students or arrange for mentors. And then finally, one program I, I think has been extremely successful and came out of the Sloan Foundation originally is the Professional Science Masters. And so that's masters in, where in lieu of doing a thesis, you do experiential work doing practica with a company. And so one example of that here at NC State is the Masters of Microbial Biotechnology, where um, you do all of the coursework around microbial biotechnology, but you also have uh, things that are also about um, from the business school that are around management and things like that. And, um, and then you go off and you work in Syngenta or someplace like that for a practicum. And that's been incredibly popular, and a lot of people come back out of the biotech industry to get that degree to be able to advance themselves through that degree. But the professional science masters, one of the great things about them is, is um, you plan it with the employers to start with. So you develop your curriculum with their advice rather than developing it in a vacuum and then hoping that you're producing the right kinds of students. A shining example of that here at NC State is um, through the Institute for Advanced Analytics. They developed the first masters in analytics. So we talked a lot talked a lot here about the big data and how that's part of everything these days. Well, this is the first actual master's, and it's been copied many times now, but it was the first in the U.S. at least. Um, it started in 2007, is now grown to 120 students a year, and they still are only accepting one in eight or one in 10 students that apply. And it's a lot of people with PhDs or MBAs already coming back to add 
this master's onto it. And it was co-founded by Jim Goodnight, the CEO of SAS. So he recognized the need for that the workforce just wasn't there in analytics and in big data. And so he made a nice donation to the university, he was very involved in helping develop this. And what they did was created something very novel. It's led by um, Professor Michael Rappa, that it's a 10-month master's, but it's a very intensive master's. So you, they actually just admitted their 12th class. They're going to be coming in this summer for, uh, I think it's a month-long boot camp, where they learn all of the tools. So all together, they learn all of the tools they're going to be using. It might just happen to be SAS tools. Um, <laughs> But they all learn the tools. But then they spend the rest of the year not in regular semesters, but in short um, kinds of segments of several weeks each. But then they also do a, work in teams to do a major practicum centered around industry data. And industry fight over and pay money to provide their data to the group and to get to work with these teams. So they have more chances for industry support than they can, can handle because they all want to hire these students. And so they have over, a, um, their employment at graduation is over 90%. I think it's very close to 100% for that program. And most of them have offers before they finish their practica and they have multiple offers from these companies. So it's a chance for them to work closely with them, work with real world solving, because analytics is not only working with the data, but turning it into actionable um, kind of analysis. And so that's what these companies are looking for. And I know RTI sponsored projects because they wanted to be able to hire these kinds of data scientists. So, um, so something like that, I think, is a, a really great example of an extremely successful program in that area. So the challenges that remain, I think, are a lot of them are around um, the PhD programs, I'd have to say. I think masters have been more flexible, and, and it's easier for a two-year degree to be more flexible and one where you don't have the expectations that you have around the PhD. So now we get into the tougher stuff. So, um, and one of those is the length of the PhD. So it's, it's isolating, and it's also a barrier to entry. So if you're thinking about being relatively poverty stricken for the next seven to nine years in some cases, in some fields. You know, the average in physics is seven years. Um, if you're smart at math and, and um, physics, you know, why wouldn't you go into computer science or an engineering degree where you can get out with a master's in two years and earn a higher salary than you're probably going to get after your PhD in physics? You have to be a true lover of physics to, to want to do that. Um, and then I mentioned before the lack of flexibility with PhD programs. Um, that it's just head down working on your one project. Part of it's because of the funding. If you're working on your, your um, faculty member's um, NSF grant, NIH grant, whatever, you have to produce on that. And um, they have to produce. So I'm not blaming folks for this, but we had, have to think about how we break that mold and get around it and what kind of funding do we have available to be able to make it more flexible for students. And um, Chancellor's not here, but make that a focus of, endow of getting um, endowed funding to be able to give students that year to explore other opportunities or whatever. Um, there's the need for more programs that bridge disciplines to solve problems. You know, we've heard about, we sort of were immersed in that yesterday here, but there's still a lack of ones that students can get into um, and that bring the faculty members together. So how do we create more of those programs? Um, support. This one's really key. Support for interdisciplinary programs and training in a traditional university structure. So you've got your deans, you've got your department heads. Where do the university programs fit? I think they started to put them under the provost here until the provost realized, I can't have that many programs that report to me. How do, what kind, right? Voin? <laughs> 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 you can't, yeah. 
And same thing with the graduate school. So what do you create within a university structure that's going to allow interdisciplinary programs to thrive? Because when budget cuts come, and we know they will, there's always cycles in funding, they're going to protect their departments and their um, and their colleges first, and interdisciplinary programs are a nice to have across the top. So, um, and then how do we just make them thrive even when there isn't budget cuts, and make it so that the poor interdisciplinary program directors don't have to go around hat in hand to five different colleges or departments or whatever to try to put a budget together every year. So that's a, a big problem to face. Um, also within that problem is for the graduate students, are they getting all the benefits that the students in a traditional department or they're getting other benefits by being in an interdisciplinary program, but is the infrastructure there that are in normal departments and colleges um, that they might not have access to as, e as readily, or at least feel like they don't have access to, like offices, you know, spaces, the, the primary um, ca um, cash of universities, and, you know, do you get as good a space for an interdisciplinary program? Um, and then just inertia. What is the crisis? What is the stimulus? What is the motivation to change? And we know it's right. I mean, it's easy for me to make this argument, but what is it that gets universities, which, you know, you would think that universities would be the place where change is the easiest. I find it's where the change is the most difficult. And so how do you get over that great inertia of tradition at universities? to um, make the kind of changes that we're talking about here. And then finally, back to you are what you measure. Um, metrics um, right now don't reflect the best interests of the students. And so they're all around, and um, I'll get to that in my next slide, but how do we then change those metrics because you are what you measure. So that's what I'm going to um, end with is the way forward and you are what you measure. And here's where I'm going to get provocative, Fred. I'm going to let Keith Yamamoto do it for me. But the positive part is change is possible if there's institutional buy-in. So how do you get that institutional buy-in? So um, quote from Keith Yamamoto, right now we have a flawed set of metrics. We place a priority on being first author in a prestigious journal. If we get rid of those metrics, we can move closer to the core competencies that students need to graduate. And remember, the goal is not to become famous, it's to become, uh, to discover new knowledge. Well, it's easy for Keith to say, because he's pretty famous, at least amongst us <laughs> biologists. Um, <laughs> but still, it's the metrics thing. Are we measuring H numbers as the most important thing? Are we measuring you know, the journals? the most important, the highest number of publications, or are we really thinking about the right thing? So I would actually modify his as, it's to discover new knowledge and to train the next generation. And I'll just end with that and let you think about that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Terry, for um, introducing our project earlier, and I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Natalie Hankhaus, and I'm working at the American Society of Plant Biology, coordinating the Plant Science Research Network. So over the last couple of years, we've had several visioning activities that led to this report that Terry was referencing. And I just want to mention um, that actually DGE, NSF, and HHMI has supported some of our um, early work here. We took an approach called scenario planning, which is an a strategic planning approach to think about the world in a very different way. Um, we created these four very divergent scenarios that are available for other people to use in their own strategic planning approaches. And so in our case, we have already done two workshops, um, one focusing, or two focusing, I should say, on the postgraduate training, but we've also looked at cyber infrastructure to create recommendations for the next 10 years in cyber infrastructure and how to create connections among different disciplines and also with the public through that. Um, but as, as we mentioned uh, in the NIS report, it's really important that the professional societies are doing some of this visioning activities, but we are not necessarily implementing these recommendations on campuses. So uh, Terry mentioned that we created this digital ecosystem, and it's called Plante. You can find it at plante.org. 
And we would really encourage you all to go and visit that site. It's for plant scientists. It's it's like kind of like a social networking and, and research uh, website that you can share ideas and create collaborations. But when we do put our report on there, it's really important that we get feedback from the community. And we were talking at our table about how this can be of interest to people, not only just in the plant sciences disciplines, but in other disciplines. So, um, you know, I'd love it if you could post your questions there or share it with other people as well. So I'm going to sit up here. If you guys have any further questions about the work that we're doing, I'd be happy to answer them. So I have two objectives here. Um, one, in deference to my colleague Brian and, and Todd, I want to clarify that New Jersey is a wonderful state and the reasons why we can. Okay. All right. More Jersey. All the shout outs. Um, yes. And so our recruitment issues at Rutgers are one thing, but the state of New Jersey is a lovely place. I encourage you all to visit. And so there's that. Two, we were talking about some of the the changes that that you are recommending, and we all sort of patently agreed. And we thought, well, yeah, our administrators at the university were were super supportive, and everyone we seem to talk to is super supportive. So why don't we see it happening? And we're wondering what it takes, and maybe other people have insight to actually do it. Why why aren't we just doing it? You know, and so I don't know if you have cases where you've seen other places just up and decide to do it. And did they do something like this visioning strategy? Did they do scenario planning? Did they do something that we could start at our institutions? Ten minutes, we'll find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if Brian has the answers, so we're done. Okay. Um, well, I think, as I said, there's been a lot of innovation here at. NC State with the interdisciplinary clusters, with the kinds of professional development they have for students, with the graduate certificates and minors and professional science masters. So my experience as graduate dean and then a vice chancellor was having a supportive chancellor, someone and provost who, when you walk in and they say, just do it. But so that is a lot of it. So mm -hmm. it's winning over the administration. But it's also, it comes down to money. And if, you know, it, if it's going to cost something to do it, where are those funds going to come from and creating those kinds of priorities? And creating a, you know, you need to, if you want to do something, create a groundswell of support from your fellow faculty that they cannot deny. Yeah, and I guess I can add that. Um, it, well, with one of the workshops that we did focusing on postgraduate training, we only had trainees there, so graduate students, postdocs, even undergraduates and post back students. And they, as we are, are very passionate about science communication. And so I think that um, many of these students came from all over the country and didn't know about opportunities or ways to get involved. And so we're actually trying to provide them opportunities through these pilot programs that came out of our report, um, but using resources like the professional societies to give them a platform to create training courses on science communication. So that's something that we're working on with graduate students and postdocs right now. So they are doing it, but they need support from the community, whether it's at their institutions or in the professional societies. And financial uh, support certainly helps a lot. Good morning. My name is Cecilia Hall. And that was just the question that we were discussing. Where will the money come from to support these students? And I was given the example that I came from a very different background, but absolutely there has to be an interaction between the industry and maybe the societies to help the, the students. And all of us in the academic or higher education are aware of these problems, but we also have to provide means for the people that are in community colleges or even K-12 to to start thinking and um, motivate the students to think that they need to study, to know, not to get a grade, and to open their minds to the world, to the problems of the world, because that's where we're going to get our students. So that's what we were discussing. So. That's a great point. And one of the things we did when I was at Oregon State University was we um, created a, we called it Science Connections, a program to go out and do research into the K to 12 schools. And the thing that's most 
impactful for them is to send the graduate students or even undergraduates because they're closer to their age. Having an old fogey professor go doesn't really impress yeah. them at all. But go out and work with them in the schools because especially, you know, where we were working was inner city Portland. You know, they didn't have any exposure to science or to college or what know, know what college looks like. And so then the capstone of that would be with high school students, allow them to come to the visitations on campus. And then we would do cool things like forensic labs, you know, where they would gather evidence from the crime scene and extract the DNA and it just opened their minds up and, and we had them stay in the dorms during off times and, and so that they, they could see what life would be like in college and that it wasn't that scary or intimidating. And I had to say that North Carolina has a lot of those resources. I, I teach in the community college in North Carolina, and I have brought many students on different activities to NC State. And I have had people from NC State coming and giving presentations to us too, so thank you for all that too. Thank you for your talk. I think you talked about a lot of stuff that I've been looking for in the last day or so. Um, and I know I asked a question yesterday, but I'm wearing my RBG descent color earrings. So what are you going to do? <laughs> um, sort of piggybacking off of something that was started there, I think we've danced around this question of paying graduate students a little bit, um, especially in non-unionized states. We've got a huge discrepancy in um, compensation across departments and disciplines. Um, and from my personal experience, like the non igert year, I was a one-year fellow, and it was wonderful and a great opportunity. I was working two and three jobs to help round out my stipends, and I would think I was one of the lucky ones. Um, so what I haven't seen talked about is how to build that financial, su financial support explicitly um, so that graduate students do have time to take advantage of these awesome PD opportunities that you talked about. So there's these barriers that I think have been kind of danced around, and I'd like to know what's happening at universities at NC State where there are incredible opportunities to help bridge those gaps and sort of balance those inequities, especially as we talk about diversity and inclusion. Thank you. So two thoughts about that. One is, um, one of the things that I didn't mention that the National Academy report calls for is more transparency in data. And so there's, you know, it's just gathering data about graduate programs is extremely difficult. And Council of Graduate Schools has pointed that out too, both for outcomes, so that students can understand what outcomes are for careers, but also I think things like pay. You know, so I think that's something that um, should be more transparent. And I think if more students realized that discrepancies across departments or um, within the university, um, you know, so if we've shown some shun sunshine on that, might be a thing that would help. But then you also need the funds um, to be able, you know, so that it's always for a department, do you have fewer graduate students and pay them more? And, um, and so the other thing is the university needs to make it a priority. It's tougher, but it's not impossible to raise funding for graduate fellowships is to get more graduate fellowships and more support for the graduate school. Um, one of the ex- uh, graduate deans at that light blue place down the road um, um, convinced her chancellor, he had one of his donors say, what's the toughest thing for you to raise money for? And he told him graduate education and that donor that now is a, a, a prestigious fellowship series over at, at UNC. That donor bit and went for the, he wanted to help the university in the best way that he could. And we have a lot of graduate alumni that nobody pays attention to or they don't pay much attention to. They pay a lot of attention to the undergraduate alumni but not the graduate alumni. When I became graduate dean here, any city I would go to, I would hold a reception for graduate alumni there. And they were hungry to be involved in something that wasn't just a football watching party. And, um, and so I think we need to use that more to raise funds. Thank you so much. Let's give a hand to Terry.